Good morning, Lori. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Katrina. How are you? I'm great. I am so grateful that you found time to uh, to be here on Zoom with me, recording this podcast, having this conversation about cultural responsive teaching. I am so, so excited to have you here today. <laughs> uh, me as well. Me as well. Thank you. Well, Laurie, I have prepared several questions for us, and like always, it's it's going to be an informal conversation about uh, your best practices, mm -hmm. my best practices. So we'll be it's just a conversation between two colleagues who share passion for culturally responsive teaching. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, a very important subject. Yes, indeed. And I, uh, well, I think we should start with brief introductions. No, not everybody knows who we are. <laughs> and uh, so let's start with brief introductions. And you go first. Sure, sure. My name is uh, Lori Eide, and I am a, an assistant professor at Columbia Basin College. I teach in the School of Education. I've uh, been there for three years as a, the lead in early childhood education. Um, prior to that, I taught at a different college for, for a couple of years online. And um, prior to that, I was getting my PhD in educational leadership, which is, um, took many years, but, but it's always been, I would say, at the forefront of my thinking in terms of my teaching practice to include culturally relevant teaching and anti-bias practices. Uh, where I learned about these practices was during my master's program. I attended Pacific Oaks College, which is based out of California. And if you're not familiar with that college, all they do is teacher education. Hmm. And the founding, uh, the founding uh, owners of the college they um, have, have embedded in their pedagogy the idea of culturally relevant teaching and anti-bias practices. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the founders was a, uh, a well-known author of many books on the subject. Um, and I have just really felt that that experience I gained um, during my master's program was at the time in the 90s, not realizing just how um, groundbreaking some of that work was and how it's evolved over the last 20, 30 years. Um, it's been a part of my, my teaching. I'm very passionate about it. And working with young children, especially is important because these young minds have bring to, to, um, to daily living uh, an innocence and, you know, young children aren't, aren't born into the world uh, with ideas that, that are barriers to, to getting along and to understanding differences. Um, and so, so there, it's the perfect time to introduce Anna Bice and Cultural Relevant in early childhood. And so now that I'm a college professor, it's been um, interesting because our college has put an extra effort into exploring these ideas for um, how to build cultural relevance practices within uh, our practices of teaching college students. And so it's, it's been a very um, great transition for me to think about it a little differently. Well, this is great. I already have lots of <laughs> questions that I will ask after I do a quick introduction of myself, I guess. It's an amazing story, by the way, uh, Laurie. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, I, um, I, uh, I'm the director for teaching and learning at Columbia Basin College, and uh, my passion for culturally responsive teaching, I guess it just started very early in my teaching career. I, um, I'm originally from Russia, and I was working uh, at the university level in Russia, started my academic career back in Russia, uh, teaching international students, teaching uh, English as foreign language classes. And also I was pursuing my doctoral in adult education. And then I immigrated to the United States and I continued this 
path um, because I just feel very passionate about teaching. I've been in higher education since 1999 in Russia and now in the United States. And this, uh, for me, it's also cultural responsive teaching is kind of a, uh, an evolution of thinking for me because the way I thought about it when I was in Russia, working with international students and Russian students that that was one, and that was a while ago. <laughs> it was, you know, um, that was kind of one thing. And then now I, I just, it's just my thinking is constantly evolving, constantly changing and having conversations with passionate people like you also uh, changes the way I think about many concepts that relate to cultural responsive teaching as well. And I'm just very excited to be interviewing you, learning mm-hmm. from you and getting to know uh, you and what you do in your classes at Columbia Basin College. Mm-hmm. And we're recording this podcast, hopefully uh, our colleagues at CBC at and other institutions of higher education will find this information relevant and and useful. But the question I had when you were doing your introduction, you said that your thinking is evolving, right? So about Mm -hmm. cultural response. Maybe before we do Mm -hmm. that, maybe we should start with a definition, right? What is the definition of cultural responsive teaching? For example, if somebody, college professors, uh, faculty members have never heard of cultural responsive teaching or they've heard of cultural responsive teaching, but they don't know exactly what that means. Maybe Mm -hmm. we we should provide just kind of a general definition of this methodology, this teaching approach, and uh, so that we we can start with that. Absolutely. I um... I would love to be able to share my uh, definition, but I have to say that my definition is based on the work of somebody who's been studying culturally responsive teaching for decades, and that's Gloria Ladson Billings. And so when I talk to my students about about it, um, I always start with a slide with her, with a quote from her. So if I could share that, that it's an approach that empowers students intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically by using cultural references as a way to impart knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Great. Cultural relevances, you said. Did you say cultural? Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by that? So let's define cultural relevance. Relevance. Yeah. Yeah. So cultural relevance, it's, it's like you you respect the cultures and experiences of various groups and you use those as a resource for your teaching and learning practices. Um, you could say to be a culturally relevant teacher, you also appreciate the strengths and accomplishments of all your students, regardless of their backgrounds, and that you involve all students in developing their in further instruction. Um, and there are, there are many different, um, uh, I guess you could say, methods for doing that. Um, when I've done research, there are at least uh, six academic, I guess you could say, competencies that are, you know, about culturally relevant teaching, which I think we'll probably get into later. But mm-hmm. so many different models that, that uh, discuss this in more detail. This is so important for me to hear because I've always, I've over, always kind of approached this with this idea that uh, students who come to to us for education are not empty vessels that we're supposed to fill with information. They already come with a, lots of experiences, cultural personal and also professional, especially community college students and community colleges, they, um, in many cases, the adults who come to get, you know, maybe another degree or, you know, Mm -hmm. worker retraining programs, and they, they worked for many, many years before they, or they're working and they're pursuing education while they have full-time jobs. So they already bring so much experience, knowledge, and wisdom. 
And uh, this, this is how I think about my students. They're not someone who, you know, I, I'm supposed to fill with information. They are mm -hmm. uh, partners. They're partners. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear their stories. I want to hear their perspectives. And that is enriching me because I don't know... <laughs> so many things mm -hmm. and when I hear mm -hmm. stories from my students it's just it's always just amazing uh, mm -hmm. to, to learn about their cultural experiences their professional experiences and personal experiences as well so this, this really resonated with me what mm -hmm. you said about cultural relevance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well the next question I would like to ask you is about mm -hmm. the work you've done to promote and you 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 already mm -hmm. talked uh, a lot about that but if you mm -hmm. could share maybe some examples the work the project that you've implemented you facilitated you championed that made an impact mm -hmm. i would love to hear uh, that sure, about sure. That. yes it's been really exciting we um, started our second year with a, a grant from the university of washington and the grant is specific to redesigning our curriculum in the School of Education uh, to be more, uh, to better prepare our students to teach in classrooms that are culturally diverse, that um, are equitable, that include students from various backgrounds, from various uh, inclusive practices so that, that we can take, right now we're starting with six of our four classes in our associate's degree program. And last year we met with um, a group of people. We, we formed um, an early learning uh, partnership with 30 different professionals throughout the region. And those included um, some employers, uh, some early learning programs, some uh, people from Head Start, from ECAP, from DCYF, which is the state organization that licensed early childhood programs. Um, we had students, we had uh, representatives from uh, bilingual preschools. And, and basically we asked them questions to help us look at the learning objectives of these classes, of these courses. And we asked them, are these objectives for each of these six classes uh, Doing, doing the best we can in preparing our students to be culturally relevant uh, and anti-bias teachers. So um, it was a year long process and we came up with some great data that we're still analyzing and, and incorporating in our courses, but the UW has been really great in um, monitoring, like sending out surveys to students that will help us guide uh, guide the evaluation process and see if those changes we're making are actually making a difference. Um, so we're in the second year. And I would say the great thing that's come out of it is sort of some um, uh, collaboration and partnerships with uh, Child Care Aware, which is, a, which is the organization that provides uh, mentoring and training of uh, centers, preschools, and schools in terms of um, their rating systems and making sure that um, that they are they are also on track for incre increasing the quality of their programs. Um, and one of those one of the outcomes has been a mentor training um, workshop that we developed with Child Care Aware, and it's we piloted it in September, and we we had. Um, teachers who uh, went through the training and now they're being um, paired with our students in the mentor in the internships and uh, practicums. And so the great thing about that is that we've had, um, I guess you could say a need in the Tri-Cities area for center teachers who are bilingual, who especially during the COVID academic have uh, pandemic, excuse me, have um, found it that they need extra support because a lot of the um, programs that went online and there were teachers feeling like they needed some extra support in terms of the technology and lesson planning and 
you know, preparation and our students have been paired with these teachers. And so it's not only are the students gaining that mentorship from the teachers, but the teachers are equally learning some technical skills and other things. Uh, so it's been a great partnership for both the teachers and the mentors. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Well, Lori, what I'm hearing from you is this advanced work that you uh, and your colleagues um, are doing in, and but the, the area is pre-K and K-12. So now I'm going to ask you a tricky question. I know you, you because uh, it, we are in higher education, right? Yes. So why do we need to care about this? K-12, I, I get it. Lots of yes, kids yes. and they come from diverse backgrounds. But mm -hmm. higher education is different, right? We, we're different. Are we? Why do we need to care <laughs> about cultural yes. responsive teaching? You know, it's a great question I because I've had this... Um, you know, juxtaposition in my mind of the work I've done in, you know, early childhood, and then now translating it to how can we help our faculty and staff at the college incorporate cultural relevant pra teaching practices, because it's, it's a newer, um, it's a newer form, I think, in, uh, in academia, I think it's a newer discipline. And so I think back at the uh, work done in the elementary grades and uh, particularly this has been around in K-12 say for three decades, um, those students are now growing up to enter college. And so there are certain ways mm. that, that they have been experiencing those environments in terms of collaboration and in terms of pedagogy that is student-centered and They've been in environments where they're encouraged to do group work and they're going to come to college. And if they're not experiencing that same structure of learning environment, they're going to expect it for one. And then you also have the benefit of the fact that teachers in college who are teaching classes who learned cultural relevant teaching practices um, are going to only be able to evolve their uh, teaching practice in terms of being student-centered, in terms of being more um, prepared for the diverse students that come to college. Um, they're going to be able to build community more easily. And if they can build more community and, and get to know their students on a personal level, not only does it lead to better student success and higher retention, um, but they're going to find that they themselves are going to be able to feel a, a more of a connection with their students as well. This notion of uh, connecting, better connecting with, with your students, that is such a powerful powerful idea and that's that's exactly how I feel about it mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and uh, later in our interview we'll talk about a strategist that any college professor can implement in their teaching mm -hmm. like tomorrow if they choose to so we'll yes. get to the practical strategies and how to in, in a few minutes but for mm -hmm. now I, I guess the goal uh, my goal with this questions is to explain why we all need to care about cultural responsive teaching, how it's going to benefit our students. And mm -hmm. that notion of connecting with the students is, I think, is very, very powerful because, well, all institutions of higher education, we yes. uh, serve very diverse student populations here mm -hmm. in the Tri-Cities area. Our college uh, is one of the largest his his Hispanic serving institutions in the state. Yes. And we also have other students who come from other cultural backgrounds. And it's important for us to adjust our teaching approaches and teaching practices so that we are including mm -hmm. our students. We are inclusive and we're equitable. And that translates in better retention, better mm -hmm. graduation numbers, uh, students mm -hmm. getting jobs. And it's just a more rewarding type of teaching if you are able to connect mm -hmm. with your students. And it's all about strategies. It's about also addressing our biases, right? So Exactly, exactly. I, I have an interesting story I'd like to share, if mm -hmm. you don't mind. Of course. Um, because I've been thinking about this a lot. And 
um, especially translating what I've learned in early childhood and K-12 to the college environment um, into higher education. And I was thinking about my students and, and um, that community building, how much more important that is now that we're online. And I took an online certificate program last summer through Quality Matters, and they talked about that presence that's so important with between student and teacher, between student and student, and then as, as a whole in terms of the community, building community. Because in online learning, we know it's more difficult um, for students to feel part and welcome. And um, I'm, my story is about a student feel, feeling welcome because if we, um, as, as college teachers, um, even though students come as adults and have life experiences, they're all unique and individual and all the students are gonna be on a different journey in terms of how they present themselves in terms of their biases and how, for example, a student who comes into a classroom, if it's in person and um, they're in a wheelchair, are the other students, how are they going to re react to that? And we want all of our students to feel welcome. And so it's an instructor's role to make sure that that student, that all students feel welcome. Um, if if um, I used to say to my students, um, you know, coming to college, especially if you are from a group that's either been marginalized or you, um, uh, you have a background maybe where you're, you speak English as your second language and, and English is not, uh, you're not feeling very confident. You're gonna, you, you might feel less welcome or you might feel more intimidated by uh, coming to the college campus. Well, I used to think back on my experience when I was going as a college, before college, uh, touring different colleges, I got so much excitement about going to the college and walking around different colleges. And just, it got me like motivated to want to enroll and learn and become a college student because the experience was so exciting. And, um, and that's really what motivated me to, um, to, to go on the path of becoming, I was a community college student and to make the leap to a four-year university. So I think back that how much more different that experience might be if I was, uh, if I had, if I was in a wheelchair or if I was a, a person of color, like would I feel this welcome? Would I, would I have that same level of motivation to go to college and walk around on campus and feel comfortable and accepted? So I wanted to add that it's, it's, it's an experience I had because I came from, uh, a position of privilege. And I have to recognize that, that, that not everybody has that experience. Tell me a little bit about your anti-bias mm -hmm. journey. What is your journey? What mm -hmm. did you learn? Biases yeah. that you address in your everyday teaching? Mm -hmm. Or let's talk about biases and how sure. they impact the way we see the world. And mm -hmm. most importantly, since we're talking about classroom uh, teaching, how yes. they may impact our teaching strategies, the way we teach mm -hmm. our students. Yes, absolutely. Um, and a bias work is something that I've, I've evolved and it continues to evolve for me. I've been studying and bias work for over 20 years. And, and even in the last two weeks, uh, I have made some, some huge aha moments. And, and part of that, it was from attending a session with you, actually, I think it was two weeks ago. So, so it made me think about the fact that that when I was doing my master's program, um, it, like I mentioned, the pedagogy was very much built into our um, program to learn about social justice and, and a bias practices. And we had to reflect. I mean, the whole program was reflect, reflect, reflect. And much to even to my liking at the time, you know, <laughs> I wasn't, 
I, I mean, I was um, just in, engulfed in this reflective practice for a year. So for me, that was the biggest, um, I guess, change. It changed the course of my life um, because I had to examine some of my biases, some of my unconscious. So, so some biases are unconscious. And, and that means that it's like something that you might make a judgment without realizing it. Um, for example, in higher ed, you, I think you had, you came up with some great examples of unconscious bias. Um, and one that's really stuck with me is that we think that, um, uh, that students, we might think that students who um, come with like older students may not be um, as prepared, you know, to succeed in our classroom, you know, if they've been out of education, say for 20 years. So, you know, or just assumptions like, and, and so it's unconscious if we're not aware of it. And then once we become aware of our bias, um, we actually can make a conscious choice to reflect and act in ways that are anti-bias. So un uncovering those unconscious biases is an important first step in having an anti-bias practice. And then I also got to thinking that if, if, we have, if we have something that we've from our past maybe, um, conscious, unconscious bias might be based on stereotypes. They all, I think, basically come from stereotypes that either we learned as children or society is like somehow it's embedded in the messaging from commercialism or from just attitudes that of everyday life. And so they start out as stereotypes. And, and if, the, if, if we truly are kind of like continuing to, to be getting those messages, they can develop into an unconscious bias. But once we've uncovered it and that reflective practice, we see it, we actually can make a choice and to say, you know what, I'm not a terrible person because I have biases because everybody does. Everybody. But it's, it's how we react and how uh, being aware of them and um, making choices to, to break down those biases that's most important. Um, and then recently I've learned that, um, you know, that the connection with stereotypes is that stereotypes are everywhere. Biases are us acting on those stereotypes. So the connection between acting on them versus when you're aware of them and they, they are not unconscious, then you can actually make different choices about how you act. That's amazing. I I definitely think that our biases, most of them are unco unconscious. Some of them are conscious. I don't know, but we all, all have them. And I, I remember when I was, I was preparing to the workshop that you mentioned earlier. So, <laughs> thank you so much. I actually did so much research in those examples of biases. That, they're not my examples. I found them uh, by doing research. And I just, in that particular workshop, because it was only one hour, I had to pick and choose the the ones that resonated with me the most and I remember I was like well how can I choose they're just all useful examples and I chose six and I remember one of the first ones uh, that really resonated with me was something about like students who are at, um, maybe failing academically so we think our bias uh, well not all of us but many of us may, may think that those students would know that they're failing academically and most importantly they would know where to find help and it's it's an assumption so what usually happens many students are actually not aware that they are failing until the last minute, until they're like, oh, we failed the course. And it's one week uh, uh, to the end of the course, and they're like, oh, we're failing, and we had no idea. So we as um, professors, we, we may assume that students know that they're failing and they're aware, but the, actually the reality is students don't know until the last minute, until they, they get that final grade. And also, uh, to that, to add to that, students may not know about the resources that are available on campus to help them. And 
even more to that. And even if they do know, they sometimes feel uncomfortable reaching out and getting those resources. And I um I know that because uh, yes, I absolutely. Yes. And let's just let's just unpack this for a second. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like one example, but it just has so many layers here. And it's very practical, in my opinion. If we as uh, professors, faculty members, we assume that students know that they're failing. Right. And they're just mm -hmm. lazy and they don't want to work hard. It's an assumption that can be really harmful. If we see that students two weeks uh, into the quarter and students are not submitting their assignments on time, this would be the time to have a conversation with the students and say, what's preventing you from meeting the deadlines? Let's talk about, and maybe it has nothing to do with them being lazy. Maybe Absolutely. there's something that they experience in, in their personal lives that's mm -hmm. preventing them. So if that's the fact, those early, I mean, that's the, the reality, then uh, mm -hmm. those early conversations with them, you can refer them to, uh, uh, for example, Academic Success Center. Uh, we mm -hmm. have amazing tutors on campus uh, here at CBC who can help yes. uh, students. And there are other resources, maybe counseling, Maybe they're experiencing domestic violence. We don't know, right, until we mm -hmm. actually ask. Waiting until the last week of the quarter to have that conversation with mm -hmm. a student <laughs> is not going to be helpful. And also, mm -hmm. I um, experienced that in my own teaching when I, when I, um, I was an ASL instructor. And I uh, had lots of students who would tell me, yes, yeah, so we know that these resources are available on campus. And we know we can go and apply and get them, but we feel uncomfortable. We feel like we don't deserve them. And somebody mm -hmm. else is in a worse situation and they should be getting that, that help, not us. I had numerous conversations with my students about that. And I would be like, no, 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 no. You deserve this help. You deserve mm -hmm. these resources. Go get them. Go mm -hmm. get them. And I would make an introduction. For example, I would personally introduce that student to a counselor and I would say, this is your counselor. They can help you. They can work with you through whatever uh, situation you you are you know, you're going through in your personal life. And you know, sometimes just simple introduction can just go a long way. And uh, that that example that I found when doing research for my workshop just really I was like boom. <laughs> um, I was my brain exploded. I'm like oh my gosh, this is so true and it's just amazing. That was just one of. Um, many examples but that example i you i chose it as one of the first examples because it just mm -hmm. resonated with me so yes. uh, on so many levels so <laughs> yes. yes absolutely and you know that that is that you know how does the student experience the college and how can we make that more comfortable for them it, it is it's an ongoing you know it's an ongoing question for sure. And particularly in the time of being online, I, I would say that um, we have that early alert system. And I learned about that during my orientation uh, when I started, which I'm, that program is built into, you know, uh, an orientation, which that I think in making sure instructors are aware of all those services is really important. Um, I just had a student the other day who I had a long conversation with um, because she requested it. She had been falling behind. And, and I tell my students, you know, if, if you are getting behind and you need a help get, making a plan to get caught up, call me or, or email me or set up a time to, to talk and um, come to find out uh, after speaking with her for quite a while, because she's had some personal family issues happening at home that's preventing her from turning assignments on time. She, um, she's a first generation college student. And, and I asked her, I said, did you know we have a program called TRIO at CBC that helps students, first generation college students? She said, no. And I said, well, here, let me get it for you. And I, you know, I got the, the website and I sent her an email with a link of who to contact. And I realized that she didn't know about that, but that luckily I did. I know about that program. So that 
just getting that information to the student is important, but then there's the question of, will they actually follow through? And I, that's a tough one. Like, how do we, mm -hmm. you know, how do we know and, you know, how do we help um, make that, you know, somewhat of a barrier, barrier less than that barrier? Do you do you think that one of the strategies to address what the question that um, you posed is by perhaps bringing um, like inviting those professionals and mm -hmm. uh, maybe spending some time during your class making those introductions? For example, you could invite a tutor from our amazing mm -hmm. academic success center and mm -hmm. they could, you know, just for maybe 10 minutes invite mm -hmm. uh, counselors um, who could just introduce themselves and talk about what they do and how they can help if students need help. Mm -hmm. The same with maybe financial aid. Mm -hmm. I, I know that, that this works really well because when I was working as an ESL instructor, that's what we did. We would, I personally would invite those professionals to make mm -hmm. introductions in my classrooms. And uh, back then I was, a while ago I was teaching in person, mm -hmm. but you could do the same in your online classes. You can mm -hmm. find them on Zoom or they can even record videos, like video announcements mm -hmm. and just for five minutes and you can post them in your online class if it's an asynchronous class. So Absolutely. there are many ways to bring, to bring mm -hmm. them into your classroom space and make those mm -hmm. introductions. And I noticed that it works really well because once they, students, see oh well here's a counselor or here's a tutor and they can go mm -hmm. and they're, they're nice people <laughs> and they're Absolutely. really friendly then mm -hmm. that it just breaks that barrier and uh, yes, and it's absolutely. just and I also wanted to um, maybe to something that came uh came up uh, I had just this idea in my head mm -hmm. so you 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 mentioned first generation students I also work with a lot of students who who were doctors who were mm -hmm. lawyers in their mm -hmm. countries and then they immigrated to the United States and the, that was their first time in American academic mm -hmm. system. This is kind of an interesting uh, experience. It was a very interesting experience for me personally, and very similar to what I had to go through as part of my personal mm -hmm. journey. I uh, was working on my PhD in my home country, which is Russia. Then I immigrated to the United States and I had to learn everything from scratch. Everything was brand new. I didn't know anything. And many students, many uh, students who come to our colleges, they have similar experiences. They were doctors, lawyers in their countries. They knew how to navigate their academic and professional mm -hmm. systems in their countries, right? And they come mm -hmm. to the United States and it's a brand new experience for them. So mm -hmm. they're not really it's not new, but it's new, right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just, it's different. You go mm -hmm, to an, any mm -hmm. country, you go to Germany and you go to the university and mm -hmm. you would have, uh, you would be struggling because mm -hmm. it takes time to learn how the system works in a different country. And you may mm -hmm. have a PhD from the United States and you would still be uh, having some challenges mm -hmm. in a different Absolutely. country. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like something mm -hmm. that uh, we also need to be aware of uh, as professors that students students come with experiences and challenges and it's just mm -hmm. it's important for us to be aware and address those biases and assumptions and mm -hmm. kind of like unpack yes. them and most importantly because I'm such a practical person I'm mm -hmm. I'm I call myself a practitioner mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I I'm all about strategies. Now let's get uh, to mm -hmm. the to the practical aspect of mm -hmm. how and yes. what 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 strategies can help? Mm -hmm. What strategies are out there that we can implement in our teaching right away? You know, mentioned many, many times community building. So tell me a little mm -hmm. bit more about that and why you think that's so important. Let's sure. let's talk about strategies. So if you were to highlight yes. two or three, the most impactful okay. strategies that can like if you do nothing else but those two or three, what mm -hmm. would those strategies be? Yes, this is, this is great. I love getting the strategies because then it's like, okay, what can our viewers take away from this and put it into practice right away? Um, and as we know, that's like the key to adult learning, right? That's one of the things um, 
that we found makes students successful in adult learning is to give them strategies. And, um, and I, I would, before going into that, kind of like just round out this idea of culturally responsive teaching and theoretically, how do you do it? Um, there are four basic components, I guess you could say. Um, and that first one is building the trust with the students, right? Um, you can start by um, on the first day of class having a discussion or have students fill out uh, a survey that's, you know, uh, that has information about uh, their background, their, do they speak, what languages do they speak, you know, asking, inquiring questions about their, who they are as individuals. Um, the second part is understanding their history and culture and the history and culture of groups represented in your community. So, um, for example, I, um, I taught a class on uh, environments and uh, science. Um, and so I uh, took my students on a field trip so that they could learn about our community. And we went to a, an interpretive center um, in Pasco called Sacagawea interpretive center. And um, it has in that center information about the history of our region from both the um, Lewis and Clark perspective since that expedition came through our region. Um, and then from Native American cultures, um, which we have um, for we our lands that the Tri-Cities is made up of is on uh, Four, four different tribes were uh, indigenous to our region. And then there's a Wanapum uh, Cultural Heritage Center just a few miles from, from wh where we live. And so I took the students there. So that's an example. And not, of course, everybody gets to take a field trip with their students, but I was very fortunate. Um, but even just introducing and building some kind of cultural um, perspectives into, into your subjects, no matter what they are, that are local to your region. Um, you know, and then really um, forming alliances with other educators who do this work um, and talking about it. Um, and we're doing a lot of that on campus and I'm so excited. I, I don't think there's a conversation I've attended in the last several months that don't involve this topic. And it's been really exciting. Um, and then reflecting and refining on your practices. Um, so kind of that's sort of the four pillars um, that I look at in terms of creating a culturally relevant environment. Um, but practically, I have three things I do that I would say are at the top of my list. Um, one is first week of class, I create um, in Canvas an instruction um, or a module that has introductions with a discussion board. I include a video welcome that I've pre-recorded um, that I ask them to watch. And I encourage them to either post a video or photo and, and tell a little bit about themselves. And I respond to each one of those, those um, posts individually. So that's one thing. Um, on the first night of class, um, I use, Padlet, so uh, that is like a post-it note for the virtual world. And um, I ask them to include something about themselves on the Padlet and it's during the live Zoom class. And so it's, it's like a living poster board of the people in the class in terms of um, their, you know, I ask them to put a picture and something about, they wanna share about their personal life. Um, and then I would say mostly what's been successful is just making myself available. I do tell them um, in my introduction that any email or phone call that I, that I respond within 24 hours or um, on weekends, I say it's 48 hours and um, I make that a priority. Um, I don't always respond to every discussion post. Um, 
and it's impossible. I mean, especially if you do weekly discussion posts like I do. <laughs> so um, I, make an, I make an effort to post several, three or four announcements each quarter to the class. Um, that sometimes it's just like, here's a webinar, here's a current event, something related to teaching that you can do. Um, or um, during COVID, I, I had an announcement about, you know, this is a difficult time. If you feel like you're needing some extra support, we have CARE, which is a program for, um, for students to get uh, contact with a counselor or just, you know, just checking in, um, you know, how are they doing mental health wise? Um, one, I got this idea from another CBC instructor that actually I did a poll in class and it asked them to choose, how are you doing right now? And it had like, I'm doing great, uh, you know, so-so, or um, I'm just barely hanging in there, you know? And even though that was an anonymous poll, I had, even if I just had one student say I'm barely hanging in there, um, I know that that is, is an indication that I need to send out that announcement about the care program. So, you know, it's, it's really just staying in touch with students as much as possible. Um, and then, and then um, having that engagement, you know, having regular substantive responsive engagement. Um, Lori, can yeah. I ask you a question before we go into the topic yeah. of engagement a little bit more? So yeah. how how would you address this question? Because I hear it a lot, unfortunately. Well, you know, building community, that's all wonderful, but it takes away uh, from getting the, the content, mm -hmm. uh, lectures and stuff. So if I spend all my time building community Ooh, in my class and, <laughs> and asking students about how they feel, that takes away time from my lectures. That That's that's yeah. why students are in my class for, for information, right? Yeah. So how would you address, I, I hear this a lot and mm -hmm. I am like mm -hmm. you. To me, building a community, if, like if you did nothing else, just cho choose one strategy that you can do building the community would be probably the, the 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 most important strategy strategy that you can do that aligns with this concept of culturally responsive teaching but let's let's just pretend we're having this conversation with someone who doesn't think it's important well i would say that there's definitely research that shows a connection between a student's sense of belonging and their and their student success. Um, I I've been teaching online for before I came to CBC. I taught online and then I was teaching in person, and I honestly um, never knew I'd go back to online. But you know, I now that I've been that I've done both, I've realized that. Um, it's very different to get to know your students online. And, um, and that's why I think it's so important if particularly with online is to students, if they don't know who the instructor is, their name, what they look like, even if they've never had a Zoom class, they're not going to feel enga as engaged. Um, I've heard of students complaining that if they don't know who their instructor is, they're not likely to, to pass the class. Um, and if, you know, say that we go back in person and we have that opportunity to engage with students, um, it's, it's easier to build community when you see them in person, obviously. Um, so, so I would say that for that instructor who feels like they need to have more time for lectures, that yes, that's that's understandable because that gives us that sort of feeling that we're doing our job. And I um, oh, but I would argue that but that that there's way more to our job than that. Because in the course of the two years I've been online since COVID, I have slowly and slowly lectured less and less and less, and no one seems to mind it. No one seems to complain, they're missing it. And Aww. so what I do instead is I record what I call mini lectures mm. each week. I record them and pre-record them and then I post them. 
So, so you're flipping your class. I'm flipping my class. And then when we get together, it's to have discussions mm-hmm. about the material or the lecture. And then also to go over like assignments. So I don't do any lecturing in, in my classes anymore. Um, and I actually, last summer, I, I've, had, I've had Zoom sessions and I don't offer them every week because I find that students seem to do better when I offer them every other week and I almost have full participation. Um, I do give participation points, a few points for them attending. And if they can't attend, I'm not gonna hold it against them, but I ask them to watch the recording because I record my Zoom sessions and um, to send me an email with a three to five sentence summary of what they learned. And I'm just, I just want them to watch the recording. I, you know what I mean? Like, it's not so much they have to send me proof that they learned something. Um, But overall, I would say that when I've had classes more and more and more, I'm getting feedback that students are thanking me for helping them taking their learning in their own hands, because I have given the power of learning to them. And my role I see is less of an instructor now and more of a facilitator of learning. So so let me ask a clarifying question. So you are saying that building the community is Mm -hmm. the most important component Mm -hmm. that will lead to higher engagement in your class. Mm -hmm. Without community and feeling safe and feeling connected, you will not have students who are engaged in discussions Mm -hmm. or group projects. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Because I... 500% 500% agree <laughs> with you <laughs> on this. And I see the same pattern in what I do in my work. And mm-hmm. in the workshop, I also gave this example. I think I, when I was um, doing the teacher training courses where, you know, it's train the trainer concept, I fully online asynchronous <clears throat> I remember I started experimenting with this com- community building components. And mm-hmm. at some point I decided that in the beginning of the training, it, it would usually last for several weeks, fully mm-hmm. asynchronous, fully online. So I would start that course with mm-hmm. a Zoom uh, session and I would email uh, faculty were the participants. So it's a trainer trainer approach. I would email faculty who signed up for the course ahead of time. And I would say the first, uh, the first day of this course, I am scheduling a Zoom session. It's mm-hmm. optional. Please come. We will just play some fun games to mm-hmm. build a relationship with, with each other because we'll be in this course for several weeks working together asynchronously. This is mm-hmm. one of the opportunities for us to actually see each other in real time. And I was amazed that every time I did that, I would have 50 50% of the course participants come into that session. And not everybody could because, you know, there's a reason why people sign up for uh, online classes because, mm-hmm. you know, they have full-time jobs or who mm-hmm. knows. But and then I just decided to do some research. So uh, next time I didn't do the Zoom. And I was like, hmm, let's mm-hmm. see what happens. And every time I would start this uh, training with Zoom versus mm-hmm. when I wouldn't start with Zoom, I could see such a huge difference. It's mm-hmm. like that Zoom session. And mm-hmm. not everybody could come, but I would record and I would post in the course. Mm-hmm. But even that made such a huge difference. Like throughout the quarter, for those uh, several weeks we were together, everyone was just so engaged and everyone was mm-hmm. so actively engaged in discussion board activities and reflections. Mm -hmm. And I just could see the difference in engagement. Uh, Mm -hmm. Zoom versus no Zoom, huge difference. Just did that experiment just for myself, for my sake, to understand if that would make a difference. And it did. It really does. And that was just one simple thing I did. Start. Mm -hmm. I started my uh, my training with a 30-minute Zoom. Never actually lasted for 30 minutes. Always would be an hour (laughs) because, you know, you plan for 30 and you never, you know. 
but it was okay. And not everybody would come, but they would watch a recording and even watching that recording, seeing each other, you know, their colleagues, their peers, you know, having this fun, doing these games. It was um, relationship building. So I'm a huge believer in, in, in that. I just, um, I, yes, I, yes. And I, you pointed out that just making l- little changes, because I could tell you that, and, and, and that's maybe part also, I think, of being culturally relevant is, is, is finding out your stu- who your students are and, and what works best for them. Because what works best for education students is not going to maybe work the best for biology students or nursing students. Um, because for example, two years ago, I started with the first quarter we had to teach online just abruptly, right? Spring of 2020. Um, I had, you know, my Zoom session every week and I, you know, I made it, I didn't require it. And after like the fourth week, I, I started out with 25 students. And by the fourth week I had like 10. And then by the eighth week, like two, you know, and I was like, okay, something has to change. And I made incremental changes every quarter and slowly, and it's what worked for me is maybe different for another instructor, but just making that small change, I went from after that, I'm like, well, I'm not going to, um, I'm going to require, they're going to, they're going to have to be there the next quarter. I'm going to give participation points. And then I realized that was a lot of work for me. Like, (laughs) <laughs> every zoom class every week taking trying to take attendance online and um and I wasn't necessarily sure at that point that that was the best way for students to learn so you know I made a, another change another change and now two years later I have a format that really works for students and for me and um, well, what is the format can you tell us a little bit about the changes you made in the final sure. version <laughs> I yes, guess yes. what you have now. Well, and I, I have two different formats, I guess you could say, because one format is for, I have, a, um, I have a cohort every quarter of new students who have to take a required three classes together to get a certificate. And so, and so for those students, not only is it their first experience at CBC, but they're all, um, well, I should say most of them are teachers already working in the field. I would say about half of them. And the other half are um, just choosing their career for the first time. They're, you know, I, mostly younger students, obviously. So, so for those students, they are a cohort. And, um, and so we meet for three classes. Instead of meeting three times a week, I actually stagger them and we rotate and they meet and we meet um, sometimes once a week, sometimes twice a week. So it's basically for those three classes, there's one or two meetings a week. And um, and then I also um, make the assignments for each class different. I provide a variety of classes for one, a variety of assignments. So for one class, I have a lot of um, quizzes because it has a lot of information that is it's a very technical class that has definitions and things they need to be exposed to and memorize. So quizzes work well. For the second class, I, it's very theoretical. And so I, I have activities that are projects. And because it's education, I actually focus a lot on culturally relevant and anti-bias teaching practices. And they create projects that are based on interests, whether it's creating a lesson plan about something they're excited about, like Mm -hmm. maybe they're really excited about um, Native American culture. Um, They get to choose, you know, their, their, their theme. And then for the third class, which is a practicum, um, they have to do a certain number of hours, either volunteering in a classroom or now with COVID, they can also watch observations um, virtually. Um, and they have to um, reflect on those experiences. They have to do like a journaling type of activity. Mm-hmm. So, so that that's one way. And I think because they're a cohort, it does make it a little bit easier. 
to have that model. And then the other model is for students who take classes with maybe as they're a second year student and they're not so much in a cohort because they're a little bit more um, spread out, you know, so students, um, I, I do re require those students to do more writing assignments, you know, at this point, they've already taken English 101. Um, and they, um, they don't have, like, I make Zoom an option for them. So I don't take attendance for those class, for those students, they're more seasoned, you know, they're more independent learners. Um, and so I make my Zoom classes optional, but I record them. And um, I have a lot more you know, reading and case studies and um, discussions, discussion boards, um, but we aren't, you know, meeting in person. I, when I have a Zoom class, I might have three or four students attend, mm -hmm. but um, those students are the ones who, who need, you know, they need that, that extra support, that extra one-on-one -on -one support. Um, and then I also um, bring in more videos. So I've been, because I'm online now, I'm constantly looking to add more videos to the to the assignments and those are the students who have been really commenting on how they feel like they can take their learning in their own hands more um, more easily well you know one um, everything you said just I think it's so easy to implement this are the like you said these are small adjust adjustments you can uh, mm -hmm. make over time not like all at once mm -hmm. right that would be overwhelming for <laughs> for everyone adjustments that you mm -hmm. can take over the course of several quarters and just mm -hmm. see how that changes the way you teach how students respond mm -hmm. to your teaching and how uh, actively they engage one thing that resonated with me mm -hmm. like really resonated with me was that um you, you said uh projects right and you give students an opportunity to choose mm -hmm. i think this mm -hmm. is so powerful because mm -hmm. sometimes we give students assignments and like this is parameters mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. this are your uh this is your box uh, mm -hmm. so just just don't 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 mm -hmm. go outside of that box just you know stay with it but i feel like well, for, first of all, the uh, project-based teaching, this mm -hmm. notion of projects yes. is just mm -hmm. so powerful, but also not just projects where you tell students what to do exactly, but give mm -hmm. students an opportunity to choose maybe the topic, maybe like um, if they're researching a company, maybe mm -hmm. give him a uh, choice to which company they want to research. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more yes. about project-based and how that aligns with cultural responsive teaching pedagogy. Well, absolutely. Um, well, for one, project-based, it gives students an opportunity to uh, collaborate with other people. Um, and particularly the we're a workforce program. And so and so it's we have to pay a special attention to the fact that what are we requiring them to do has to be something that that's relevant to the workforce and that that they could apply to their job. And um, when you have a project, that becomes part of the student's portfolio. Mm. And um, and so the projects like and I think every every industry or every program at CBC um, can probably relate to some projects that they could apply on, you know, on the job. And for education, it's a lesson plan. So um, for them to do the research, well, not only can projects help build collaboration skills, um, but also how to do research. Um, I, you know, I'm like of the mind that in the old way of teaching, you know, we saw students as empty vessels, right? And as teachers, we just fill them up with information. And we live in an age of information at your fingertips with the internet. And so for me, it's less important for me to, for them to demonstrate that they've memorized my lecture. And it's more important to help them develop skills that will help them be resourceful. And that's 21st level, that's 21st century education. And and so I've been aware of that, and I feel like projects are in alignment with 21st century education. And then 
then also they're building, you're building in an opportunity for them to bring parts of themselves. And that's where the cultural relevance comes in. My um, first quarter at CBC when I had in-person class and we had uh, a project for the introduction to ECE class. And, um, and so they had to create a, um, not just a lesson plan, but like a whole annotated bibliography of 20 different resources related to their theme. And I said, you can um, you know, uh, pick something that you're passionate about and, and then choose how you present it. So they had to turn something in, which was the 20, 20 resources out of annotated bibliography, but they also had to have a presentation portion. So they um, could choose to do, um, you know, like a PowerPoint, they could choose to do uh, a, like a, a poster board, they could choose to um, do it some kind of like a three dimensional um, display. I tell you, that was like, that was like my first quarter and it just blew me away because we had students who came and um, they worked in groups and I kid you not, it, it was like, a, it was just a night of celebration that, that um, involved just seeing the students come to life, you know, and how they presented, they enjoyed it. Um, we had a, one student who did a topic of Mexican folk dance and their niece and nephew were professional dancers and they came in and danced for us. That was their presentation. Um, and so the cultural relevance is important, but also they are learning skills, how to speak in front of groups. Um, they are those skills that they can take with them. And they really, I think they fit really strongly with our institutional learning objectives. Like how to replicate that in online format is, is yet to be, I've yet to find it be as exhilarating experience, but we still do students, you know, present if their final projects um, in Zoom. They prefer to do it in small groups, which actually makes it for a time. If, you know, if we tried to do, have everybody do a presentation, it would probably be a three hour class. So I have them do it in small groups and we're not doing live, you know, dance <laughs> uh, demonstrations, but um, you know, I, I do look forward to getting back to at least having something like that in person at some point. Absolutely. Well, Lori, I just I feel like we can talk for another <laughs> two hours. Just, just so much to uh, discuss, and they're like, oh, I have this example and I have that, but. We got to pay attention to the time. And uh, so um, I would love to do another podcast with you and we can talk yes. a little bit more and go a little bit yes. deeper. So we'll be maybe part two. I don't know. Let's yes. let's yes. think if yes. we know if we have time and when we can get together. But um, I just... I, I just really appreciate your wisdom, your best practices oh, that you're sharing. And you. I'm really excited that you found time to connect with me and oh, record this you. podcast. It's been <laughs> such a pleasure.